So those of you at the back, if you'd like to just wander forwards, this first slide just establishes my credibility here in India. Uh, the title of my presentation, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the title of my presentation is Self-Leadership and Transformation. First, I want to take you back in time to the year 2000. In the year 2000, I had just been disrupted myself. The business that I was involved in had been disrupted. I'm not going to go into the details. That's another speech. You can see that on one of my TED Talks. But in the year 2000, I was sitting in a boardroom that looked much like this slide. I had re-established myself, and I had decided that what was important to me was creating change. And I was sitting in this boardroom as an executive coach waiting for my client. My client was a CEO of a fast-moving software company in the marketing space. He was Australian. He was Italian on his mother's side, Irish on his father's side. He was a big guy, very fiery, very passionate. And I have to say, I was slightly intimidated by him. But I was sitting in the boardroom waiting for him to arrive, and eventually he walks through the door, and he's a big guy, and he walks in, and you can feel his energy as he walks into the room. And he looks me straight in the eye, and he says, Andrew, I am too busy for coaching today. Now, the, 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 the heckles started to rise. I'd driven across town to be there. I had made an appointment. I had turned up. I had expected him to turn up too. We have that expectation, don't we? But thankfully, before I said anything, he kept talking. And he said, I'm too busy to be coached today, which is exactly why I need to be coached today. This was a rare leader who had the self-awareness that self-development was as important as tactical issues within his company. This was a leader that understood that working on himself as Mahatma Gandhi was quoted as saying, be the change you want to see, not in the world in this case, but in his company. He understood that as the CEO, he leveraged the organization. We had an amazing two-hour session, and we talked about his vision for his company. And I listened because he was very clear, because in a previous session, I had shown him how to imagine the future. And he said to me, after our last session, I have imagined the future, and this is what I see. I see this, and I see this, and I see it in color, and I feel it. That session changed both our lives. His name is Grant Halloran. Grant here has gone on. He took his company from Australia to Silicon Valley. He IPO'd his company. He made a lot of money and got hired by the company that bought him out, Infor. And then he got hired by Anaplan, and he worked with Anaplan through the hypergrowth years. And now he's with OmniSci, and they visualize data. So anybody in software understands he's in that space. He's a Silicon Valley executive and serial entrepreneur, and he tells me to this day that it was that day in that boardroom when he saw it happen that he put the steps in place for his future and his company's future. That meeting changed my life. You see, I'd just gone through a business disruption myself. My self-esteem, my self-confidence, my self-belief had taken a hit. Nobody likes to fail. But in reinventing myself and taking that learning, which was humbling, enabled me to help Grant and many other leaders, and I went on to work with multinational organizations like Microsoft, like Singapore Airlines, like SAP, like Red Hat in the software space, banks like UBS and Credit Suisse, and here in India with companies like Vertuza Polaris and Merck Millipore, some of whom ex-members uh, of the leadership team that I work with are in this very room today. And as you can see, I've done TEDx talks, and I wrote a book I've written a number of books, but I wrote a particular book on self-leadership. And, and that was what I had discovered in that room with Grant, is that we can't lead others unless we first lead ourselves. You understand that. Self-leadership is not a new concept. Plato talked about it. Lao Tzu talked about it. Right? Mastering others is strength, but mastering self is true power. 
And yet I was really interested in, in the, the psychology, the sociology, the anthropology, and the leadership aspects of self-leadership. And so in 2012, with Dr. Anna Kazan, we published this book. Simple side story. Dr. Anna and I, to this date, have never physically met. We collaborated across the world through the power of this thing called the internet. Have you heard about that? Yes, you don't have to be in the same room to build relationships anymore. And as you heard in my introduction, I now work, uh, I, I'm, I'm faculty at Singapore Management University for the Women in Leadership Program, uh, and I work with the IE University out of Madrid on global MBA programs. So I work with leaders. And I know that leaders like yourself in this room, whether you're HR leaders or whether you're business leaders, you've come here today because you've got problems. Why else would you be here unless it's a day off work? You've got problems. Uncertainty and change. As the recipient of the award for his book talked about the VUCA world. It's not a new term, VUCA. It's almost become a cliche. Vol volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. You know about that. You need to attract talent. You need to develop your talent. You need to identify leaders. You need to develop leaders. You've got to do succession plans, vision, values. You've got to deal with AI, automation, change, change, change again. Anybody here got change fatigue? All right, you're running 27, 2700 change programs within your organization. I know you have problems. I feel you. And I know that you come to a Congress like this because you're looking for tools. And all the booths outside, as you go, and you should visit the booths that sponsor the Congress, and you should visit those booths, and you're looking for tools, software tools, tools for addressing each of these problems. But here's the problem with tools. To the man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And sometimes it's not about the tools. You know, I was interviewing a CEO recently. In fact, very recently. It was last weekend, in fact. And the interview was over a barbecue at a friend's house. He had just, for his company, two years ago made an acquisition. And within two years, quadrupled the value of that organization. And now he was retiring. He was too young, in my opinion, to retire. There was a little bit of jealousy in me just there. Because he had made... $2.5 billion for that company. And, and I said to him, I said to him, you've been successful by virtue of money. I'm curious, in terms of people, leadership, culture, what have been the problems that you've most needed to solve in being successful? And he said, as a CEO, it's all about results. People, leadership, culture, they're just tools to get the job done. Now, any of us who have a kind of an empathy to people would find that a little bit harsh. And yet, to some extent, he's right. Now, the market measures the numbers. It measures it in terms of tools. But I don't think leadership is about tools. I think it's about style. You see, what if there was just a pill, right? A pill to develop your leaders, a pill to develop your talent, a pill to solve the problem. There are a number of pharmaceutical represent, uh, companies represented here, and pills make a lot of money because if you're sick, you will pay any money for the pill for the solution. The um, CEO of Red Hat, a software company, said, you know, it's not rocket science, but if anybody can solve emergent problems for their clients, they will never go broke. We need to solve the problem. But you know, funnily enough, I actually have a medical background. I didn't make it into medicine. Uh, I was going to, I was a straight-A science student at an English grammar school, and I was destined to do medicine, but the government, in its wisdom, decided to merge my boys' grammar school with the girls' high school just before my A-levels, and something happened, I got distracted, and I did physiotherapy as a second choice. And even though I didn't do full medicine, I was still indoctrinated to the concept that prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. So careful of the tool or the pill. Be careful of being like that CEO who is always looking for ROI, return on investment. Because I don't believe that in the people space, we measure it in terms of return on investment. I know it's called human resource or human capital, and we know what it costs. But if we reduce the humanity to a dollar figure, we miss the opportunity, in my opinion. Because in my opinion, 
The issue is not ROI. The issue is TOI, transformation, ownership, and impact. Transformation is the change. We as leaders in HR or learning and development, or you're a leader of an organization, it's about change. We have to transform our mindsets, we have to transform our behaviors, and we transform the world. Because nothing really happens unless it's a transformation of energy. And if we go back to the physics of it, all right, if you take a product and you produce it, there's a transformation of energy. So everything is about change. And the key thing here is ownership is that people are going to be responsible for that change. The problem that you have with your change is you're trying to change people. People don't like to be changed. And yet change, as we know, is inevitable except from vending machines. Some of you will get that joke later. So ownership or responsibility. Now, if you saw the Spider-Man movies, you know Uncle Ben said to Spider-Man, with great power comes great... Yes, and with great responsibility comes great power. When we take the ownership, we have the power. And when we have the power, then we can make an impact. Today, I am here standing on a stage. In the year 2000, I'd just come out of a business disruption. I was $300,000 in debt with zero assets, except my ability to change my mind and influence others to change their mind. And today, I travel the world, and I get to make an impact on companies. I've just recently interviewed 36 global leaders in different areas for the Self-Leadership Success Summit. Uh, this is uh, going live, 1st to 3rd of March, so you've got time to watch it. It's absolutely free if you watch it live, so there's nothing to sell here uh, other than you need to register. Go to learning.selfleadership.com and it'll take you straight to the registration page and you'll get to here. And there's Grant Halloran right at the top because I interviewed him on his lessons of success in those periods of time. Down on the bottom, uh, down the bottom right, there's a guy called Manish Bundin, who often comes to this conference. He was a student of mine. I trained him to be a coach. I trained him in, in NLP, which I was uh, trained in many years ago. And he took HR in Mauritius from being a cost center to being a profit center. Because that changes the way that you're treated at the senior leader level. Because HR should always have a seat at the table. HR should not be subservient to finance. Otherwise, you are all about ROI. You know that old chestnut, don't you? That the CFO says to the CEO, what if we train our people and they leave? And the CEO says, yes. But what if we don't train them and they stay? Therein lies the problem. So come along to the Self-Leadership Success Summit. All you need is an internet connection. But what I realized in interviewing all these people is the stuff that we teach around leadership is not really changed. Now, the definition of leadership depends on who you talk to. Bass, who gave us transformational leadership, says that the, there are as many definitions of leadership as there are people who have written on the topic. I think leadership is a dance, and here I have a beautiful Indian dancer here, because leadership is always a dance of three things. Three things. Like a three-legged stool, if you address all three things, it does not wobble. And those three things are the leader's style. Remember, it's not about tools, it's about style. You see, different leadership styles are appropriate for different contexts and different followers' motivation or empowerment engagement. And this goes back to a 1974 model. It's called Path Goal Theory. And it's by Mitchell and House and a few other researchers. And I'm including it in this year's book, the book that comes out this year. You see, people have always said to me, Andrew, what's the best leadership book? Have you ever been asked that? You know, I, I want to read one book. What's the best leadership book? Do you get asked that? What's the best leadership book? So this year, I'm writing it. And it's called The Best Leadership Book. So you'll be able to go to bestleadershipbook.com, and it's coming out later this year. And I'm including a 1974 model in it because it's still current. This model says that leaders need to adapt their style. Now, often we complain that our leaders are directive. We want them to be more participative or coaching or, or consultative. But you know what? Directive leadership is important. I flew here on an A380 from Singapore, where I live now. And if... 
the oxygen mask had fallen from the ceiling and if the captain had come out of the cockpit and said to us, ladies and gentlemen, there's a bit of a problem. I'd like to get you into focus groups and work out what you think I should do about this. How would you feel if that happened to you? So there are times in crisis we need directive leaders. However, if you're dealing with highly motivated, trained, technical individuals who have a high sense of identity and your directive, they will leave your company. If you're dealing with millennials who want to be involved and engaged, they will leave. So the followers' mot motivation and, of course, the environment. And we live in this changing environment. To create a self-leadership culture, we have to develop this ownership and responsibility, and the technical term for that is autonomy. Auto from self, the Latin for self, onomy from law, self-law. How does that work? Autonomy. You see, we are born autonomous. We, we, you know, we see children, they, they meet their everyday needs, and they scream and they cry if they don't get their needs met. And then we're conditioned as we grow up. We go to school, etc., and we're told to follow the rules and to obey, and we're conditioned. And a lot of our creativity goes away. You don't have to teach children creativity. They have it. You don't have to teach children innovation. They have it. And yet we have to retrain people because they've lost their self law because we have tribal mentality, right? Human beings, anthropologically, are very tribal. And the tribe was more important than the individual. And this is cultural. One of those people interviewed on my Self-Leadership Success Summit is Dr. Fons Trompenar, in my opinion, one of the leading edge thinkers on culture. So how is self-law important? If everybody's doing their own thing, how do we move the organization forward? Well, I've got a session after this where I'm gonna go and deep dive on that. But this is the quick overview, that a self-leadership culture requires autonomy because when people can think for themselves, they can be agile, right? They're not following the rules. There's a great British comedy show called Little Britain. Has anybody ever seen Little Britain? And there's a recurring skit in Little Britain where people go and there's a lady behind a computer and whatever they ask, her response is, computer says no, all right? What are the worst words that you can ever hear in customer service? It's not my job. Has that ever been said to you? How does that make you feel? It's not my job. Whereas if somebody feels the ownership on their company. One of my executive coaching clients runs Grand Handling. Now, do you remember a few years ago with United Airlines where they broke the guy's guitar and he caught it on film? And then he wrote to United Airlines and they didn't do anything about it. So he wrote a song and it went on the internet United breaks guitars, and then that got a million hits very quickly. Well, this guy, a lovely guy, his name's Kevin Chin. He's my client, and he was working with Singapore Airlines who have SATs, ground handling, and they went into a joint venture with AirAsia. Now, lo and behold, somebody's sitting in an AirAsia plane with their, looking out the window, and the guys are throwing the bags. You see, Kevin had inherited his ground team from AirAsia, and he had not yet inculcated the culture of autonomy yet. Now, as a leader, what does he do? Because he knows that video is going viral. History will tell you that's going to happen. So Kevin gets out of his office, and he gets down onto the runway, and he gets out a camera, and he starts filming himself kissing the bags as they go on the plane. And he says to these guys, these are your bags. You, the customer service is your responsibility. They may not see you. They may not know your name. You're not the guy that checks them in. But these are your bags. This is your job. And then they start kissing the bags. And that video is the one that goes viral, not the one of the bags being thrown in the bag. You see, with autonomy comes agility. And he had to show them how to be autonomous. And now they are coming up with creative ways to be more efficient on the tarmac. Interesting. So I'm not going to give you a tool today. I'm going to give you a model. I'm going to give you a way of thinking. And this is a theoretical model. It's going in my 2019 book. It's not in my previous books. By the way, just FYI, um, oh, I got a VUCA world. So this is the textbook. It's used on MBA programs. It's available on Amazon. This is the 2016 version or the handbook because my marketing team said, Andrew, your book is great, uh, but it takes too long to read. I said, well, what does that matter? He said, no, because people won't read it. So we wrote that 
uh, this book so that you can read it in under an hour. And I'm going to tell you how you can get this in a moment if you're curious. But in this first book, the one I wrote in 2012 with Dr. Anna Kazan, we define self-leadership. It's been written about before, um, but we, we, we define it as the practice of intentionally influencing your thinking, your feeling, and your actions towards your objectives. I'll run that again. The practice of. The great Zig Ziglar, the motivational speaker. Anybody heard about Zig? Anybody old enough? He used to have this wonderful southern accent, all right? And, and he used to say, motivation is like taking a shower. The effect is not permanent. All right, I took a shower this morning, and I smell pretty good. Anybody want to check? Of course not. But if I don't shower tonight and I go outside in the streets of Mumbai, tomorrow I will, yes, have alternative body fragrance. See, it's a practice of, it's a daily practice of intentionally influencing what you think about, what you feel, but most important, your actions. Talking to entrepreneurs, they take action. The difference between an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur and everybody else is the gap between the idea and the execution. Lots of people come to me and they say, I've got this idea. And I say, don't tell me about the idea. Show me the idea. Show it in action. So we did that. We defined it as this. But when I was chatting to one of my friends who's an organizational psychologist and researcher, he said, where's your theoretical model? And I said, well, it's in the book. He said, there's lots of research in the book, but you haven't put it together as a holistic model. And I said, gee, thanks, because that's what good friends do to you. They challenge you to be better, because that's part of self-leadership, isn't it? It's about going out there, trying something, getting the feedback, and making the adjustment. So together with my friend who's an organizational psychologist, we looked at what is the roots of self-leadership? How can we make it real? And at the, the axle of this is context or culture. Everything is context dependent. Self-leadership in North Korea is not going to be the same as uh, self-leadership in North Delhi. It's going to be different. So context matters. But everything starts with self-awareness. Remember Grant, my CEO, he had the self-awareness to recognize that he needed to change. Self-regulation or self-control or self-management is that intentionally influencing our thinking and feeling, making sure we wake up in the morning, we have our practices, whether it's meditation, mindfulness, whether we're reading, reflecting, or journaling, whether we're exercising or stretching, whether we're planning our day, whether we're putting things into our diary so they get done. What is self-regulation? Having interviewed these 36 leaders for the Self-Leadership Success Summit, having coached people for 20 years, I know the difference between successful people and the not successful people is their self-regulation. I know that I wrote a book on self-leadership because I needed self-leadership. I needed to regulate my emotions and my communication. Do I get it right every time? Hell no. Am I getting better? Every day. So that's self-regulation. And the most important thing for moving forward is self-learning. And congratulations to each and every one of you that decided to be in this session. Give yourself one quick round of applause. Go! And stop. Okay, very good. That's enough. All right, because you, all right. Because you took the effort to learn. If you're here to learn and to expand, then that is what self-learning is all about. You see, I've stood on stages now for nearly 20 years, and I've shared. And some of the things I used to teach, I don't teach anymore because we've discovered, we've researched, we've changed. The biggest issue with change is the transformation of the mindset. What we know about human beings is this ability, this bias to hang on to old beliefs that don't work. When I'm coaching a senior leader, one of the first questions I teach them to ask themselves and then ask their teams is this, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? Because who asks that, right? What if I'm wrong? Because even the best leaders I've ever coached, and I've talked to other people in my field, and I've said, what's the statistic around good decisions? And pretty much the ballpark figure is even the best leaders make about 7 out of 10 good decisions, which means 3 out of 10 are not so good. But if they've put themselves you know, standing up above everybody else that they're perfect and, and they don't encourage their people to speak up with self-leadership to challenge, then they're going to miss those 3 out of 10. If you're traveling in a car and you're in the passenger seat, and you look over at the driver, and it's a long drive, and you see the driver's eyes slowly starting to shut, and the car drifting across the central line into oncoming traffic, do you sit there quietly and politely? 
or do you say something? Right. You say something. And that's, you see, if people within your team have ownership, they're going to say something if you're doing something silly or not spotting the difference. So that's self-learning. So what's next? What's next for you? I think you understand the issue that ownership, autonomy, and responsibility, that that is the key. It's not a tool. It's a process. It's a mindset. It's a shift in culture. All right? and, and if that is of interest to you, I'm running another session at 12.15 in the rooms one and two, which is through that door and to the right. This is not for everybody because I'm going to go into some theory and some, and some practice. And, and so if you're a C-level executive or you're a senior learning and development person, if you're at the moment ready to do some change, then that's the session for you. Otherwise, you stay in this room. There's some fabulous speakers following me. But if you're ready to do that, then you're going to be moving to that session, which will start at 12.15, and I will do a deep dive. My Speakers Bureau Right Selection are here. They have a booth, and they have copies of that handbook that I wrote in 12, uh, 2016, which has seven mindsets for self-leadership and five strategies, making 12 mindsets and strategies to be successful in life and business. If you want to buy that book, you can buy it from Right Selection's booth outside. If you want a free copy and you're a C-level leader and you want to go into the detail, then if you come to my session at 12.15, I will give you a free copy. I'll even sign it for you. But I'm going to get serious in that room. You see, I'm a coach as well as a speaker. And, and, and as a coach, I will be friendly. But I won't be your friend. Because your friends don't tell you the truth, do they? Your friends have an investment in the status quo. They like you just the way you are. If you start to change too much, if you start to develop, I mean, if your friends are fat and you start losing weight, do they encourage you to lose weight? No. They offer you more food. If your friends are smokers and you're giving up smoking, do your friends encourage you to give up smoking? No. So as a coach, and let's face it, look at me. I look like a nightclub bouncer, all right? You know, I got the bald head, right? But you know what? I, I think about myself as, as a Rottweiler. You know, if you've ever had a Rottweiler, they're great dogs. They're big and they're, they're, they've got great paws. They're incredibly loyal. They've got a big heart. But you upset them and they'll take your arm off. All right? And, and I see myself as a catalyst for change. The transformation, ownership, and impact are my values. What gets me up every day, what is my intention, is to create change. So I don't want to work with organizations who HR says, oh, we want to run a program on leadership. And I go, great. And they say, how much? And I say, well, what's the scope? Who are the leaders? What do you want changed? And how do we know it's successful? They say, we don't know how much. And I say, a million dollars. And they say, what? And I say, well, if you don't give me a scope, if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, and you don't know how you're going to measure success, how the hell am I going to bill you for that? But if you're ready to do a deep dive and understand how, Autonomy creates agility. I'd love to talk more. I'm here for three days. Thank you very much. My name is Andrew Bryant.